I have a lease on this spot until the policeman comes along. <laughs> <laughs> and how old were you? I was about eight years old, nine years old then. And were people kind to you? I mean, they drop a little dime in the Dime bucket? me foot. I sold them for 25 cents a pack. <laughs> These cards. And during those days, that was pretty good, that you know. That was big money. Oh, 25. yeah, in 1922, 23. And um, were, were both parents living at the time? No, my, my father died before I was born. Uh -huh. He died May and I was born in July. My mother raised four boys. <laughs> and uh, my uh, father taught elocution at Valparaiso Indiana College. He was also a master electrician, uh, an attorney, and he was also a clown with Hagenbach and Wallace Circus. When we were little tiny boys, my mother took us to the uh, uh, B.F. Keys Theater in Indianapolis where she worked. Uh, she ran the elevator and then after the theater closed at night, she worked as a charwoman and she gave us uh, tickets to go to the theater. And I sat there and I watched the first time I'd ever seen a, a stage show. And I, I, I sat there and I watched all the, the, the actors and stuff. Not until the comedian came on. He fell in the piano and he'd shoot, look down at a gun and it would go off and all these stuff. And I turned and I watched the audience. And I saw all these people who had great tragedy on their faces, it disappeared. And they started laughing and stuff. And I said, boy, that's what I want to do. I'm going to try to make people laugh. So I was sitting on the elevator stool. My mother was running the elevator up and down. And I said, you know, Mur, I said, I'm, I called her Murk. I said, I'd never say mother, mm. you know. I said, Murk, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to be in show business. I want to be. And she looked at me and she said, well, I knew that it would come out in one of you boys. I didn't know which one. And then she told me that my father had been a clown at one time with Hagenbach and Wallace Circus. Later, I joined the circus. But I went home that night. And the next day, I stopped by the grocery store and I got a little a box, a little wooden box, that, like oranges and stuff used to come in, you know. Yeah. And I cut it down. And I made a proscenium arch across the front, and I cut little clothespins, cut faces on them, and, and draw them, and paint the little faces in as my actors. And I would write these plots and things. About uh, I was about seven, eight years old then, and uh, uh, I would write these little short stories and let them act them out. And I had my own little theater, the curtains and everything. And so finally, uh, when I was ten years old, I was working at J.C. Penney's down in the basement, knocking nails out of boards. Eh? Now, if you want to cut in and ask me... No, anything, no. Go ahead well, I, uh, why, uh, why, I, <laughs> why did you have to get the nails out of the boards? Well, no. They, these crates would come. Oh, I see. And so they, didn't, they couldn't stack them in the alley again, so they had the nails out. So they brought a, a gentleman downstairs, and the manager of the, the, um, of the penny said, uh, we got a guy downstairs you ought to see. He's funny. This kid is funny. He's not the village idiot. He's funny, you see. Now, Vincent, we, we didn't exactly have a, a village idiot. We took turns. <laughs> <you know. laughs> It was a city job, oh, right? Oh, yes, yes. And, uh, yeah, and like, uh, like I talk about, uh, I went back there not long ago, and they said, how come you haven't thought about coming back and being in politics if you're interested? And then I said, I think I'd be a great politician. Because once my mind's made up, I'm full of indecisions. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, he came downstairs, and he says, well, would you like to go to work uh, with my medicine show? And uh, a medicine show for yeah, those... What was that? Well, a medicine show was a platform that's built out on an open lot. And the people come and see the show for nothing, and you sell them things. They call it television now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, he, he uh, gave what me... What did he sell them? Uh, he sold... Um, well, I told him I'd take the job for $10 a week. And so I would hitchhike rides over to uh, Lawrenceville, Illinois, and there was a fellow there who uh, would pick me up and took me over there because he was working at the, um, uh, the Texaco uh, refinery over in Lawrenceville. And he had this old star automobile. And we just bought a new piece of property. And with this ranch that we bought, in the barn was an old star automobile. And I now have a star, the first car that I ever rode to a job in. And it was not the same car, of course. But, but you have I'm one? I'm going to have, I have one now. And uh, I'll tell you strange things about automobiles in a, in a few minutes if okay. you want to hear about sure. them. But to get back to show business, see, I, I keep interrupting myself. You know? That's all right. <laughs> I think you're going to jump in and ask no, me No, 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 that's a good flow. Yeah. I'm just curious, did they sell medicine? Yeah. Oh, yeah, they sold... Is that uh, feather bothering? Did you get that from the... No, I'll tell you. When I, I hope I'm not giving you anything. No, uh, it's... Uh, uh, what it is, see the dressing rooms here. I, I, what? They're wonderful. 
This is true. This is true. This show is the first show. Whoever you are, they give you a dressing room according to it. Now, when, uh, if Frank Sinatra would come on, it would be Italian Renaissance. Here. Yes. Sammy Davis is Southern Colonial. Right. Mine is early American. Yes. <laughs> I'm dressing behind an Indian blanket back <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know what the guy sold. He sold what was called um, um, hot spring system tonic. <laughs> made, <laughs> hot spring system tonic made and manufactured in the city of Hot Springs, where the water comes out of Mother Earth boiling hot, where you can boil an egg in less than two seconds' time. Now, if I were to tell you that that water was in this bottle and it wasn't, you could sue me the same as I forged a ch check against your bank. He says, if I was to tell you, it was yeah. <laughs> we used to make that stuff up, and we had a great big old wash boiler, you know. Yeah. Now here's what it consists of, and it worked, boy. It was good. <laughs> you tried it? Brown sugar. Yeah. A half a pound of brown sugar to give it color. Five pounds of Epsom salts and water. Oh, didn't a lot of your audience run away? I told, I, I told Bing about that. I said, you know, we could manufacture that. You're selling us grapefruit juice and all this stuff. I said, we could, we could do it. Yeah, Minute Maid. I said, uh, we, we could sell this stuff, see? And we could do a big special. We'll have one announcement about our, our tonic and then Bing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a break. We'll come back with Red Skelton. <laughs> and much more. <laughs> and Bing. <laughs> Sounds like a, a joke, maybe. But we were very poor. We were, were a very poor family. The other three My, boys? Uh, they, What'd they do? Well, one turned out to be a, uh, he's, he passed on, but he was an uh, electrician and did radio, and, uh, and uh, he was very much interested, even in those days, of television. And he'd show me uh, in these popular mechanics in those days, had this big disc to show how they were going to show this, and I was fascinated with it from that moment on. And my other two brothers, one uh, was in the cleaning and pressing business, uh, had a cleaning store, you know, pressing. And my brother Paul, uh, he was a master carpenter at uh, 20th Century Fox. Ah, uh, ah, good. Yes, but... Uh, you left home at 10 years old? 10 years old. See, when my father died, uh, he, I was going to tell you, he was a very brilliant man, yet my mother could neither read nor write. And when uh, he would send her f uh, uh, letters, and this is how he wrote them to her. He told her what each flower meant. And he gave her a little dictionary of what each flower was. And he would bring her a bouquet of flowers home with each flower in there, and she would read the letter that way. Mm -hmm. See? And at the same time, taught her to read to uh, know what the flowers were. See? So it was a kind of an interesting to leave love home story. Go out well, I, I, ten. I, at 10 years old, I you work in the, the summer. Yeah, yeah, I work in the summer. And then I would go to school, and well, the Posey, who was on the show, the doctor's little girl, was only four. <laughs> I felt like an old timer, you know. She was four, and you. She were was four. Ten. We were working out on the stage together. She was kind of funny, this little girl. I uh, I saved up my money. The second year I was out with a medicine show, I saved up money to get my first suit of clothes. Where I always wore a sweater and a pants, you know, or yeah. those Mackinals that we used to yeah, wear, yeah. you know. And I finally saved up my money to get enough for a suit. And it was in it was in St. Louis, and I got a secondhand Kuppenheimer for six dollars. So I said to uh, one of the girls on the show, I says, "Would you do me a favor? Could you cut the pants off a little bit for me and uh, and because uh, they're too long?" She said, "Well, I'm not going to sew for anybody." And I said, oh, "All right." So I went to the other lady and asked her if she'd do it. <laughs> this is a, no, she wouldn't do it either. And the third one, she wouldn't. Do it. Finally, they must have felt ashamed of themselves because when I put on my pants, they were up to here again. <laughs> <laughs> Every one of them went in and cut, cut a couple of inches. Piece. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so that actually was how Junior was born, the mean little kid that I used to oh, do. That's because I had the little short pants suit now, you know? So I, <laughs> so I put on the Buster Brown wig, you know, and all the... My mother made my first wig for me, uh, my blackface wig. Yeah. She made it out of a, 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 an old chinchilla coat, and she cut the ears around it like this, you know, and I put it on it as a skull cap is what it was. Mm. <laughs> and she made me big red ties and stuff. You is know? it possible you remember... The first laugh you got yes. that pushed you into comedy? Yeah, no, I, can, I wanted to do comedy to begin with, but I was frightened. 
And the first thing I did was to sit on the stage too close to the edge like this, and the chair fell over, and I fell in the audience. And that was my first big laugh. Mm -hmm. But to do that for every show. Well, then I got so that I, it was so when I I'd tell a joke and I didn't get a laugh, I'd fall down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the first joke that I remember that I wrote was, uh, and I still use it when I make personal appearances. It's the first thing that I say on the stage. It's like a good luck thing for me. I walk out and I say, um, I didn't think anyone would recognize me, but coming in uh, uh, the stage door, there's a group of people out there. And I, like I said, I didn't think about it. Somebody yells, Red Skelton's in the crowd. And they all turned around and looked at me. And I was so embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> I said, I was sorry I yelled. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and then I did jokes about, about my school teacher. I said I was chewing gum one day with my feet out in the aisle. And the teacher says to me, take that gum out of your mouth and put your feet in. <laughs> Put up bump, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If it didn't get one then, I was going to fall right on the floor. You know? Did you go into uh, was it vaudeville that time or burlesque? No, or? after after the medicine show, I joined uh, the uh, Hagen and Back and Wallace Circus, and Clyde Beatty was the trainer oh, on that. Clyde. And uh, that was the year I wanted to be a line uh, trainer. This was my ambition. I said, I'm going to be a line tamer, boy. Tamer, they used to call him. You can make them mad. We call them a line tamer. They're trainers, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I used to stand there and watch, and I, I'd help the guy feed them, you know, the meat cutters. They'd go around and feed these animals and stuff, and I'd say, hi, Betty, hi, Charlie, you know, I'm trying to get acquainted with them. Wink at the line, so in case I did get a break, he'd know me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'd All you me. meant to him was run. Yeah, I'll run and tell the others. Yeah, I'd walk in that cage and he'd run to the others, and the guy says, go on in. Uh, uh, Beatty says, go on in. He won't bother you. His wife says, you got red hair. And they don't like light meat. I said, he could take a bite and spit it out if he didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long did you last with the circus? Uh, until I saw the lion jump on him oh. and rip him to shreds. Oh. Yeah. He did a trick where he got a tiger to turn over on its back. And as he did, he dropped the chair. Now, a secret that he told me, as long as you've got a chair or a whip in your hand, that is what keeps, they, they, they keep watching. And they don't see you. They, yeah. But he accidentally dropped the chair, and as he did, the lion sees him, and he, I mean, the tiger rolled over on his back. You know how a cat is, you put him on the back, how quick he is. Mm. Jumped on him, and this lion jumped on the tiger and saved uh, uh, Beatty's life. Shh. And um, that night, he was back in the cage again, one arm all bandaged up, and still whipping around there with a... Mm. Saying that show oh, business, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Another year of this, and I'm giving it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you last with the circus? Until I saw that lion oh, yeah. jump on that guy. <laughs> that right out it. the door. That huh? did it, boy. I tell you. That. Were you were you, were you at that moment though intrigued by the clowns? Oh yeah. I uh, well, here's what happened after that. I I was working as a clown. I was working a clown. Tom Plank and Earl Shipley were the producer uh, producing clowns, and I went. I asked them for a job, and I told them who my dad was. Well, they didn't know him either, you know. Yeah. And um, so they said, well, we'll let the kid work in the car with us. They had that old car that used to rear up in the yeah, air and, bang and shoot, fire and I, I yeah. shoot the fire guns out of the back and I'd jump up in the air. And then they put a dress on me and I would, uh, I would pretend that I was a girl on the way in and the people coming into the, and grab a guy and walk with him and everybody laughed, you know, because I had a big nose on and stuff. And they uh, dressed up like a dame. And then I did uh, a walk around where I did magic. I'd take an umbrella and put it in my hat, put the hat on, walk around, go up to the next place, take off my hat and pull out the umbrella, see? Yeah. Well, you know, that's... Uh, freaks, they have freaks in that uh, I was there. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after this message. <laughs> This is Merv Griffin. Hope you're enjoying our show this evening. Be sure to stay tuned for Metro News with Ken Jones and Charles Rowe tonight at 10 on KTTV Channel 11. Maharishi pays second visit to Merv tomorrow night at 8.30. Are there any days that were depressing, hungry, broke, uh, thinking, what a useless... No, I'll tell you, I was very... Uh, 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 it sounds like everything's I, I, I. The, um, it's a horrible thing. It's... Uh, uh, I've, I figured out a long time ago that you can blow your own horn and sound taps at the same time. No, you know? no, no. You know? uh, yes, uh, but I'll tell you what I did. In, uh, I was stranded once. I was with a, a medicine show called Williams. This guy, his name was Williams. 
and he was a high-pitched man. Now, there were two kinds of medicine shows. One was the low-pitched man with the open, but this guy was a high-pitched man with a tent. He walks out the first night, and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm here merely to sell this medicine. He says, And with each bottle of medicine, we're going to give you these solid silver glasses. Now, tonight I'm only going to sell one bottle. He sells one bottle for a dollar and gives him the glass, and he says, Thank you very much. Are you satisfied? He says, I am not. Tomorrow night I'm going to have a dozen. Just for the advertisement. Now, each day it gets bigger. On Saturday night, with every bottle of medicine that is sold, we're going to give these away. So they go through the audience and sell them matter. Hold on to your coupons, whatever you do, you know. And in the meantime, we're going over to pick up the glasses and be right back. And they left town, and I'm out in the middle of this platform because they've taken the tent down to make room for the people. See? And I'm out in the middle of this thing with I'm singing the same song six times. See? <laughs> and finally, they, they were going to lynch me. You know? oh. And so that somebody says, well, let him alone. He's just a little kid, for God's sake. Don't hurt him. And finally, I'm crying now. And I was left stranded. I had no money or anything. So I went into a gas station and I washed up. They didn't even pay my hotel bill. It was like a dollar and a half a week and they fed you with the, with the room, you know. They give you a room, you know, the old thing. You, you close the door and the doorknob gets in bed with you, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you never got, you never advanced yourself because when anybody come up to talk business with you, <laughs> there wasn't enough room to swing a deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I, uh, I left town. I went to a, a gas station and washed up because I didn't want to go back to the watch call. And so I lost my uh, rest of my uh, makeup and stuff. And so I uh, was shaving, you know. And the soap slipped out of my hand. I wiped off the watch call. Now I turned on this, and the steam came out of this little thing. And everything steamed up except this one spot on the mirror where I had wiped off with soap. So I said, wait a minute. So I had maybe, what, 75 cents left. So I go down and I buy two long bars of Castile soap. <laughs> and I got a pair of eyeglasses, see? It was the dime store, 25 cents, I think they were. I sliced these things up. I went around the street and I picked up cigarette packages that used to have that tin foil. Sure. And I'd wrap each one of these little things around and made it a package. Then I took... Uh, uh, the paper from the hotel room, the little hotel that I checked into. And I wrapped this paper around that and glued it. Now I put on my makeup and I go down and I sell fog preventers for eyeglasses. <laughs> really? Yes. I sold them. They were, they were 10 cents a piece, three for a quarter. And I'll never forget this one guy. And I'd show him how it worked. You rub the soap on, see, and then you wipe it off, and they won't fog up. See, this is true. If you're shaving in the morning, before you shave, just put the soap on the mirror and wipe it down, and the whole bathroom will steam up except that one spot. Eh? Never knew that. Yeah. Did you make a lot of loot? Yeah, not a lot of loot. I had enough to get back home. I had $45 to give my mother when I got there. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Nice. So um, I sold these fog preventers, and I'll never forget this one thing. <laughs> this guy says, how will it work on windshields? I says, great. So I often wondered, this poor guy goes out, and he soaps up. He's wanting to start raining. He's walking down the street like a bubble machine. Yeah. <laughs> You know what would be funnier right now if some old gentleman sitting there, she's that shit lousy lady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. just got up and you're dying too. I can feel you do this. No. Do you feel like doing a well, I'll do concert something. piece for us? Well, if you want me to, yeah. It's Anything. Lovely. What would you like? Oh, I love everything you do. Well, I need a hat. Got a hat? Yeah, Manny. Oh, um, I'll, I'll let them make their choice. Um, in the Ziegfeld Follies, I did the Guzzler's Gin. Um, You're, I can do, I can do looking at the, I can do uh, uh, the fellow going to the hospital looking at the babies, or I can do, uh, I won't do the gin because that's too strong. We'll uh, save that for later. Uh, I can do a little short pantomime for you. Sure. Uh, 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 the little old man. There it is, right through there. Okay, here it is. Thank you. Oh, Gee. New here. Yeah. <laughs> he ain't going to be old, I'll tell you that. <laughs> here, I'll work over here. Does this be right. all right? Perfect. Uh, uh, this is uh, a little pantomime of a, of a little old man, a little boy, and a balloon.
saw you and brought you to Hollywood? Who saw me and brought me to Hollywood? Um, Were you on Broadway at that time? Yeah, I was, I was at the... Um, I, was at I had already played Low State, and I was at the Capitol Theater in uh, um, Washington, D.C. I was the official master of ceremonies at the White House for six and a half years under the Roosevelt administration. Were you really? Yes. Uh -huh. As for the gridiron luncheon for Eddie Cantor introduced me the first time for the... Um, March of Dimes. March of Dimes. Sure. Now, the scene changes. I had made a, uh, a screen test in 1932, and nothing happened, you know? <laughs> Uh, before that, even, I made a screen test, and um, uh, nothing really happened with it. I said, well, what happened? They said, they didn't like the hat. Mm. I said, the hat? I'll buy, I'll buy a new hat, you know? So they didn't want to hurt my feelings. So I'm at the White House, and Mickey Rooney came back, and little Mickey uh, says, uh, what am I going to do out on stage, you know? He says, I, this is all kind of new to me and stuff. So I wrote a, a routine for he and I to do, you know, on the stage. So he came out, and afterwards, he went back, and he says to Mr. Mary, he says, I saw the funniest guy I ever saw in my life. He says, you got to go see him or get him out here or something. So uh, Frank Brzezaghi overheard heard this. And then I was working with Lupe Velez. Oh, boy. Eh? And um, uh, I'm talking now about Metro. This is after I made the first picture, uh, having a, a wonderful time. I was at Low State, New York at that time. Yeah. This mm -hmm. is the first picture. Yes. That's about 1937. And that's Ginger Rogers. Yes. In the green. Ginger Rogers. And you know who was in that? In Douglas thing? Fairbanks, Jr. And you know who else? Lucille Ball was one of the, uh, more or less like an extra in the picture. Isn't that Yeah. Sad. And we sat in the dressing room and talked. I think I can point her out to you. Um, um, no, she's not there. Not in this still. Bless her little heart. Uh, what year would this have been about? About 1938, 37. 37, oh. because in 38 I was on radio then. Yeah. But I made this picture. Uh, I came out here, but the big thing for pictures was Mickey Rooney was responsible for it. Before that, uh, Nat Holt uh, talked and got me uh, actually in pictures. But didn't you? I always heard that you... Was in a drugstore and a director saw me. No, no. No. <laughs> that you... <laughs> You talked Metro Golding Mayor into putting a little clause in your contract. Yeah, I did. That nobody else ever thought this, of. Yeah, this was in 1939. I came out here and they says, uh, we got a contract for you at Metro Golden Mayor. Yeah. This is after I did flight command for Metro. They said, they want to sign you. And I says, fine, I want a radio and television clause. They said, well, they, got the, they gave you the radio clause. I said, I want a television clause. They said, you want a what? I said, I want a television clause. This is 1939. They said, Oh, come on. You mean you turn down $2,500 a week for uh, something that don't even exist? I says, it's here. I said, it is here. It's right around the corner, and I'm going to tell you something. If you guys don't get with it and understand it right now, your theaters are going to turn into garages mm. because the, you better start making it and thinking about this business right now. So uh, now the television industry wasn't exactly idiots either. I'll think we get into that in just a minute. But finally, they says, we'll put that clause in. I'll give it to him. If they, What's television? They're laughing like, hey, you know, the idiot. <laughs> in 1949, I says, I'm going on the Milton Berle show. They says, none of our performers go on television. I says, you better get the hot iron out and put it on that contract. Watch that print come through. <laughs> <laughs> and you did it. I, I did it. And then after I went on Milton Berle's show, I says to Metro Goldwyn Mayor, I'm, I, I want to give up my contract. I want to go into television. And they said, uh, well, what about your pension plan? Uh, you've got over $150,000 coming to you. I said, it's yours. Really? I gave them the $150,000 pension, and I said, I'm going into television. And I started accepting every invitation that I could where people invite me to their house, see? And I would get up and entertain. And everybody said, what, what's with this? You're getting... I said, I want to find out what they laugh at in their living rooms. See? <laughs> Boy, and so I went planet. out, and, and, and I, I, I saw this, and it dates back to my brother in 1922 showing me that thing on the screen that's, that's coming through the air. It's the greatest form of entertainment in the world, but I personally believe that they're misusing it in a lot of ways. I agree. They are. Um, a man who's the head of a network, not to pick on any one network, but this man made this statement that violence is not picked up by the programs. This doesn't affect people in their homes, their thinking. And I asked a simple question to this man. 
how come you charge $250,000 for 30 seconds to sell a product, and you mean to tell me that if you can sell it in 30 seconds, what that one hour is doing to somebody's brain with what you're throwing at them? See, this is the only home I've ever known has been the theater. It's my only home. The only living rooms that I've ever had, even to this day, is when I went into these homes of these people who are like seated here now. And never before has an actor had this kind of an audience where he can reach out and actually show his talents. And I think the actor is at fault. When they give them some line to do, uh, they say, I'm not gonna do it. Well, it's with the times. It's not with the times. There can't be that many people who are thieves and robbers and on dope. So why should they keep flinging it at people all the time? See? Mm -hmm. I think right now, one of the big problems and what crime has, uh, is, is coming from, young people, I don't care who it is, wants to see their name in print or they want to see it somewhere, that's why the graffiti. That's why kids go up, and we, when we were little, I used to write things on the wall, see, uh, fences and stuff, dirty things, but I'd misspell the words so they'd think a moron did it. Ah. <laughs> I think I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, we all want recognition. We all want to build our own monuments. Individuality. That's right. Now, if these young people now who are on the street singing in the back of cars, singing and playing their guitars and out in groups and things, if there were theaters across this country right now, and the government's talking about these politicians and stuff, what they're getting, four years of something for nothing they're going to give somebody to put them into office, and once they get in, for four years they're gone. What they've planned on it is all over. But they're now getting a pension for the rest of their life. The, the next generation's going to pay for it. See? So why not take some of that money and open up these theaters? Here's what it puts to work. Restaurants, hotels, uh, people coming into town to p have entertainment. More people on the street, less crime. Because when there's big crowds, there's less and less. Because they're afraid, they're more fighting. These young people then get a chance to walk on the stage and sing their protest songs. And if nobody pays their money at the box office to come in and hear it, they, they'll know real quick to change it to what they will come in and hear. See? And that way, the young people, the new comedians, the new fellows who go out and tell jokes when, around with their own little groups, and they say, gee, he's funny. Now he goes out and he goes to work, and he, and he feels he's not doing that well. Next thing you know, he's telling a joke that's a little bit off color. Now it's a shock, and the people laugh at the moment. Yeah. They don't remember him. And so the next thing he says, hey, that's what it, and the next thing you know, every joke is one right after another is just, uh, shortcuts for thinking instead of going out and doing uh, well, as bad as it was the uh, little balloon at least people say oh well yes isn't that funny look at the kid going in the air they see it nothing offensive to it we'll be back after this message the off on each tire ten dollars on four i tires. just don't see how you can possibly we can't be. that's why i'm out trick-or-treating oh my yes Here's how we eat a Valencia in the Grove, son. From that end? That's the sweetest part. Aren't there Valencias in Minute Maid? Oh, perky pineapple oranges and those rich Parson Browns, too. Why do they use more than one kind? Why, oranges are different, just like Hope and Crosby. So the makers of Minute Maid blend juicy kinds together for a very special taste. To me, it's the perfect taste. 100% pure, too. Nothing added. If it's Minute Maid, there's no doubt about it. How, how many years were you on television? I was on the uh, television for 20 consecutive years. Right. Now, there are other people who were on longer than I was on, but not consecutively. Right. Uh, Ed Sullivan was on for 22 years uh, consecutively. Yeah. But uh, 20 years consecutively? Yes. And I was 15 years in radio uh. and 15 years in motion pictures. And always in the top 10? Never out of the top 15. Right. At okay. any one time. Yeah. Any, do you have any bitterness about not being on television? Right no, now? I miss the people. I miss being able because I, I I write a lot. I write music. I write short stories, and I paint, and I, I like to reach people to try to entertain them because I feel that each of us here were put here for a purpose, 
And if you can make someone forget for one second and they laugh, regardless of what it was, they had forgotten about what their problem was. And to me, that's always been important. And there are very few people in the world uh, like uh, internationally known comedians or clowns. There has never been more than 35 at one time in the history of the world. 35 internationally known. So it's, a, it's by special appointment. I think it's as much of a dedication as the most uh, religious monastic monk to go out and make people laugh, to see themselves or to see someone that they know and not actually hurt them by, by doing something. They laugh when they see themselves. Yes. The women would laugh the hardest at this moment if they saw you. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah? <laughs> I need a chair. I need a chair. Yeah. Um, in a motion picture called um, uh, Bathing Beauty, I, I did this uh, scene of a, uh, the girl getting up in the morning. And naturally, it's uh, a little changed now because of the garment stuff. I need a, a, pla a flat chair. Yeah, right here. You got a flat chair? Yeah. yeah. There it is. Over here, over here will be the, the mirror, the makeup, and this is the bed. Uh, if you got something back there, wake me up like they do in a hotel, you know. <laughs> hey, you hold her, I'll milk her. something about that. Uh, you getting tired? No. No. There's Lucille Ball. That's yeah, it. Yeah, that DuBerry was a lady. DuBerry was a lady. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great picture. With Esther Williams, Texas Carnival. Yes. Ben Gage was in that, too. No, uh, Ben Gage was, he was married to Ben Gage at that time. What was he? Oh, he was an announcer. 
Yeah, he was an announcer. Right, right. I think right. he was with Bob Hope at one time, wasn't yep, he? Yeah. Yes. Love these. Eleanor Powell. Yeah, there's a dear lady. Yeah, and Lady Be Good. Yeah, that's uh, Lady Be Good. Yes, that was with... And you know who this is over here? That is uh, Dr. Wilby. Robert Young? Robert Young. And Southern. And Southern. John Carroll. John Carroll. 1941. Wonderful, wonderful people. You know, talking about Eleanor Powell, there was a woman who was, a, was really dedicated to what she did, too. She was lovely. And she had her own Sunday school at one time. Did she? Yeah, on television. Her I television at Sunday school when she was married to Glenn Ford. And uh, she was very gentle, and she taught me a lot of things. Like, um, not that I'm over-religious in any way whatsoever. I've studied 26 different religions, and my religion is God. I'm a 33rd degree Mason, mm -hmm. and I think that's a pretty nice religion because that engulfs uh, also um, the Knights of Columbus because at one time they were all the same organization. See? And uh, I, what, what we do, if someone hurts me, for instance, I, um, I have a sectai, a little uh, Japanese garden made of sand, and I have, a, no, oh, no. <laughs> uh, I, have, uh, I have a glass of iced tea, and I think of five of the nicest things I can about the person who has hurt me. And then, if he hurts me again, I sit down, and I have my iced tea again, and I think of five of the nicest things I can about that person. If they hurt me the third time, I light a candle, I pretend they're dead, you have respect for the dead, and you don't mention them anymore. <laughs> We'll be back after this message. I think most people are aware that, uh, of your artwork and that uh, collectors, the great collectors in this country, many of them are very proud to have your work among their collections. Mm. Uh, you don't like to talk about money, but I'll, I know for a fact that your original paintings sell upwards to ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 right. a painting yeah. and uh, Franklin are Mint, highly prized. Fra Franklin Mint paid 11000 for one, 11500 and in Honolulu at the Center Art Gallery, who carry my paintings, uh, they sold uh, at my art show that I just had there this summer, uh, two paintings went for 12500 the rest went for 7500 up to... Ten to two, twelve thousand five hundred. So. Can we look at this uh, yes, extraordinary sure. yeah. display we now, have here? Yeah, and another thing that I that, that I do, I have prints of these, and the prints sell for the ten dollars. Because people say I'd like to have one. Now if they can get either one print or they can get all seventeen prints for a hundred dollars. And what a lot of people do with their children or for holidays, for instance, like with the Christmas clowns and things. Uh, I don't, we didn't bring him in. Oh. Yeah. Well, I think he sold backstage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we've got to find that. Christmas Is this the Christmas one with the holly? No, that with something like that. Yeah. No, he's almost like this one over here. But what they do is they put these prints on cardboard and they buy one frame. They, ah. And then about once a month they can put a new painting in the back and they've always got a fresh painting there in their home. Let me ask and, about and, these two paintings. Uh, these, these are uh, Mr. Kubo's children in Japan. And these were painted from Polaroid, uh, uh, little Polaroid pictures. And I painted his children for him. Yeah. And uh, this is, kind of, this is a, a lovely little child, I think, over here. And it's a, sort of a Christmas clown down here. He's got a broken golf club with yeah. him. Yeah. And there, here's, here's one over here. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a Christmas yeah. clown. See. Bill Hara owns the original of this. From Harris in, yeah, in uh, uh, Reno and Tahoe. In, in, in Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he bought this from me. I That's, uh, I think that was 7500 And Bob Hope's wife bought a, a golfer from me uh, for Bob's birthday. And a lot of nice people, Mr. Ed Pauley, uh, Colonel Michael Paul, and... Uh, oh, I would be a list like this of people who really have them. That's very... Marie Chevalier, uh, I did a painting for him. And then when they did his life story on television, there between a Monet and a Renoir was my painting. Yeah, that's kind of nice, that's you know? Great. For a guy that left Gratifying yeah. feeling, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, on, uh, on Johnny's show, I talked about um, uh, how when I was a little kid, uh, in school, I, I went around and cleaned all the ink, uh, not the, the paint uh, can, little, little pads they had. Yeah. And I put all the colors in little glass jars 
And that's how I got my paint to paint with when I was a little boy. And then I would take and cut big hunks of my hair out and tie strings real tight around it and made my brushes. You've paint. been painting a lot lately. Yes. I <laughs> <laughs> well, it saved, saved money on the... On the, uh, on the it gives uh, a finer touch. Too. Yes, yes. But yes. that must be very gratifying to have acceptance from an audience well, of something other than your comedy yeah, and the uh, music your acting instance. and your yeah. music. Yes, I still I'm am a proud owner of a tune called Here's, here's to Merv. Here's, here's to Merv. Merv. Yeah. Here's Merv. Here's Merv. And you write a lot of marches. I write marches. A lot of these people here have probably marched to my music in school and didn't even know it. If uh, I raise the curtain, would yeah. you conduct the orchestra in one of your compositions? Yeah. Would you? We're going to get, uh, we're going to have a march. Is there a particular story to this? Uh, uh, no, this is a red, white, and blue march. Red, white, and blue. <laughs> red, white, and blue march. <laughs> and um, um, the Black uh, Watch of Scotland uh, and the United States Marine Band have made recordings of this. Uh, the, the Black Watch has a recordings of all my marches out. Great. And um, at noon at Buckingham Palace at the Changing of the Guard, the Grenadier play this for the American tourists. Ah. Mm -hmm. Red Skelton conducting yeah. his own competition. after this message. <laughs> Come on. manager came backstage and uh, at the end of the first week, almost to the end of the week, and the theater is packed. Every, every show, the theater is packed. He says, I can't figure it out. This is the lousiest picture that was ever made. He says, and this theater is packed, every show. He says, and when the movie goes on, it leaves and a new crowd comes in. He says, we got people, we ask them, if you've seen the show, please leave, because there's people outside in the snow waiting to get in. So he says, would you like to stay another week? I said, sure, I'll stay another week. Mm -hmm. So uh, in later years, I, I used to think about this poor, simple soul. He said uh, he didn't know what was bringing the people in. 
Well, here's who he had on the stage, see? Now, I was working as Master of Ceremonies. They had uh, a singer with Harry James's orchestra, <laughs> whose name was Joel Stafford and Frank Sinatra. Uh, the opening act was uh, acrobats with these poles way up in the air, and the understander, this handsome gentleman, was Burt Lancaster. Yeah. All and fairly unknown all, at the time. No, we was just, it was just that new period where the bands were just starting to hit. So Frank says to me, he says, I'm going into New York with Tommy Dorsey. I said, I'm opening there too. See? And right after we get through with this engagement, he left Harry James, and we all practically started together. But it was exciting to think that this many people was on the bill, and the manager of the theater says, I can't understand what they're coming in for. <laughs> <laughs> Bella like is a lousy fellow. Boy, right then, I says, I'm getting in television. Yeah. <laughs> well, how, was Hollywood in the 30s and the 40s? Exci as exciting as we read about? Oh, I don't know, because I wasn't that well known among the big stars. I was like everybody else. Can I have your autograph? Did you have heroes? Oh, my goodness, I mean, would yes. you follow people? Because oh, you, yeah. you were part of the MGM group, the group family. of players. Yes. The family yes. players yes. were the greatest stars. Yes, the most and, and they used to come over stars. on the my set. And I, I guess I did that uh, gin routine a million times just for actors alone. Just for them they, to see it. Yeah, they would come, o come over. Greta Garbo uh, came over and they said she never laughed. I saw her laugh. Did I you? saw her <laughs> lean over like this, you know. Like that, you know? And um, uh, those, those, those were really Clark talented. Gable. Yeah, Clark Gable, yes. Now, you know, Mer, really, I don't mean this to be uh, in a, um, a sense to be uh, vitriolic or anything, but I think there is only one star now, I'm talking about stars. A guy that if you walk down the street right now and say an, see an accident, you say, he caused it. He caused it. Or there's a beautiful girl. I'll bet you a dollar he knows her. And that's that little guy with that crow in his head. What's his name? Beretta. Uh, uh, Blake. Robert Blake. Robert Blake. Yeah. He's a star in your eyes. He's a star. He's Why? A star. Because he, he has a... Well, star I'm not arguing with no, you. He's star, here all the time. He is, a star is, uh, is something you look up to. And this guy, he, you could introduce him as your brother and be proud of it. Or you could say, this is my husband, whether he was or not, and you'd be proud of it. And people would accept him and say, hey, about that. He's just a nice fellow. He's got that certain something that you can't put your finger on. You know, if someone has talent, you can put them behind a brick wall and they'll come through it. So when young people say, I would like to get into show business, doggone it, don't like to get in it, get in it. But they want to become stars yesterday. They don't want to have to go out and work. Yeah. You know, now just sitting here and getting those few little bits, I'm already perspiring, see? These young people, when they get out on the stage, like I said, they start telling these uh, uh, jokes, smoke a cigarette, they drink in their hands, and, like this, and, the, and, and the audience don't know what they're talking about. They don't care. And they say, well, I've got to win them over, and uh, I'm not making enough money. I don't want to play that joint anymore. I played more joints than any guy in the world. And I worked on walkathons as master of ceremonies. What thon? Uh, uh, walkathons, those dance marathon things. I was master of ceremonies for three years for those things. But I was working every day. I'd go to work at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon and work till 5 and never leave the stage or the microphone. And then go to work at 9 and work till 2 in the morning. And boy, you fight that audience every lick of the way because they've got these contestants out there that they're rooting for. And you have to be funny on top of this. So I was accumulating all this material. I was able to walk up and say, hi, how's your family? And even to this day, when I go back, now I'll go to Kansas City, I'll go around, I'll look up people's names. I have books, see? When I would play a town, I would write, Charlie Barber, wife, Sarah, three children, one not healthy, uh, uh, Fred the Butcher, so on and so forth. Now, I get, going back into that town, hi, Fred. Oh, hi. Hey, golly, oh, you remember me, huh? Sure. Sure. And didn't cost me a thing to be nice to this little guy. And on top of that, he'd come to the theater to see me. See? And I got friends in the audience. You're your own public relations? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I said, May I be personal for a minute? Yes, Ask, go ahead. Is your private life happy right now? Oh, yes, yes. Good. I'm happy. My wife is lovely. She's got the most beautiful blue eyes you've ever seen in your life. They're like deep pools of water. And if you look in them real close, you can see jaws swimming around. No. 
Sister. No, my wife is very lovely. The uh, vicissitudes of life don't bother her. She raises quarter horses. One stepped on her foot the other day. She didn't even get angry. I walk down the street and lovely ladies walk up and say, oh my, how are you? And they kiss me on the cheek and stuff. She never gets jealous. She, she's just, just good. She's nice and she's good. But wherever she spits, grass never grows. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Same about a lady. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You live on a ranch, don't yeah, you? Yeah, she raises horses. She raises quarter horses and thoroughbreds. She's got uh, one of them uh, Appalusians. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, she's got uh, cutting horses. She gets out with these cows and bulls and stuff and rides and gets them. And this horse, she just sit on its back and he knows what to do. Yeah, oh, I need. Oh, quarter horses are Yeah, if, 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 if um, he was a little nicer, I think I'd want to marry him. Yeah. She... <laughs> Yeah. No, but the horses, and they love her. That's, that's the main thing. They can be over there with seven or eight different horses, and she goes, <whistles> and boy, they come a-running. The thundering herd. Yes. No, the, the, the bucko and dandy are nuts about her. Do you wear and Rose. cowboy boots and no, walk around no, like a cow? No, I have to be very careful because I have asthma, and uh, that's why we moved up to Anza. That's where, by the way, if anybody wants any of the prints or know about them, before you send anything in, ask for a brochure. Yeah. They, and we'll mail it to you. And then they're, they're wonderful Christmas gifts. That's when... Uh, Where's Anza? Anza is... California? Uh, Anza, California. It's between Idlewild and Palm Springs. But it's up in the mountains there. Oh. And we just bought this new little ranch. And on that ranch was that little star automobile that I told you about. And, uh, and we're going to write a motion picture and use this, uh, the barns and things as they are now because it looks like the little house on the prairie, you know, yeah. <laughs> right now. We'll be back after this message. <laughs> uh, I think we're all uh, dying to see you do a bit that you made famous, no. uh, that you'll long be remembered for, yeah. that actors admire, that other comedians admire, that audiences go crazy over. It's been done, in, you've done it in motion pictures. If you hadn't offered to do it live today, we had a backup. We had it from the motion picture you oh. did it. Would you rather run the movie? No, no, no. I like to see the movie. No, no, no. <laughs> I'll buy you a ticket. But here's Red Skelton in his most famous routine called Guzzler's Gin. Yes. The FCC, the Federal Communications, say that you cannot sell anything on radio or television that contains more than 26% by volume of alcohol. Now, you can sell beer or wine, but you still can't drink it. But you can't sell hard liquor. So I'd like to try and show what might happen <laughs> if they could sell hard liquors on television and the announcers had to use this stuff instead of just saying, try this, try that. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> this is Kabish. Kabish, CBS, Kabish. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely evening is to bring the children close to the television because this is the Guzzler's Gin program. Have you tried Guzzler's? It comes in two sizes, the college size and the jumbo elephant size. With Guzzler's, there's no bad taste, no after effects, no upsetting the nerves, just a nice, smooth drink. Pour a little in your glass and... <laughs> <laughs> You proud of that, ain't you? Huh? You proud of it. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass and drink it right down, but be sure and ask for Guzzler's Gin, a nice, smooth drink. <laughs> 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 Who cut this? <laughs> Cut this in, friends. Mm -mm. Drink a little after dinner. <clears throat> Drink some before, you won't have to eat any dinner. <laughs> I'll be back in a moment with more from our sponsors. In the meantime, here's our guest star of the evening, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Sapini. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> Why, this is ridiculous. 
I don't even know Howard Hughes. <laughs> hey, there, show you how nutty the world's getting. There's a case for you, Howard Hughes. You ready? Here's a guy that no one's ever seen. Now he's missing. <laughs> star of the evening, J. Newton Numskull, Doctor of Poetry. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. My first poem. <clears throat> Put 15 cents on number five. That ain't it, wait a minute. <laughs> My first poem, Algae. <clears throat> algae saw a bear. The bear saw algae. The bear was bulgy. The bulge was algae. <laughs> And now back to our announcer and Morphma sponsors, Guzzler's Gin. <laughs> it's the Guzzler's Gin program you're looking at. Have you tried Guzzler's? It comes in two sizes. Get the college size tonight. One bottle, you're in a class for yourself. <laughs> With Guzzler's, there's no bad taste, no after effects. No upsetting the nerves, just a nice mood drink. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass. Pour a little in your glass. Pour a little in your glass. and drink it right down, but be sure and ask for Cousin's Gin a nice mood drink. <laughs> Why can't I get an oatmeal program? <laughs> Cousin's a nice mood drink. <laughs> That's mighty dry gin, you know that? Mm. <laughs> it comes in five, uh, two sizes. Like, now back to our guest, I J. Newton, I'm still, take it away, Nudie, I don't feel too good. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, you drunken bum, you. <laughs> My next poem, uh, The Prison Cell. In a prison cell, a dreary place, sat a prisoner who committed a sin. The warden said, you have one hour of grace. He said, okay, pal, send her in. <laughs> and now back to our announcer who will sign off the Guzzler's Gin Program. <laughs> comes in 29 sizes. With guzzlers, you don't need a chaser. <clears throat> Nothing could catch you. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass. <laughs> Pour a little in your glass. I'll get rid of it somehow. Pour a little in your glass and drink it right down. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> it's cold, eh? <that's> Don't get me to laugh into your heart. You'll never get out of here.
got to show you a couple of other Red Skelton projects because they're fascinating. This is Red Skelton's Clown Alley, a story coloring book. It's wonderful. The various things you've devised for children. Here's Red Skelton's Frog Follies, mm. <laughs> a story coloring book. Now, they get those through the Garvette in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And the big fellas, for little fellas, story coloring book. That's lovely, Red. And I want to show them this book on two of my favorite people in the whole world. Yeah. I worked with them. Yes, I yes, know. Yes, Gertrude and Heathcliff yeah. by Red Skelton, with I, illustrations I, by I, the I author. I have another, another uh, uh, Gertrude and Heathcliff coming out, and it's... Um, here, look at her here with the egg. And that's what the story is about with a new one. She's a little seagull, and she, weigh, she lays a six-pound egg. <laughs> oh, and becomes Walter Pigeon. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, uh, yeah. this famous record, The Pledge of Allegiance, uh, yes. as reviewed by Red Skelton from the Red Skelton Hour, was January 14, 1969. Yeah. Um, Red, how in the world can we ever thank you for all of the enjoyment and for the fun you've brought into our lives? It's just incredible. I, I don't ever remember not knowing Red Skelton or enjoying him. You're, you're a, a magnificent man, no. and I love you very much, and they do too, and we'll just applaud you. Thank you, Red Skelton. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you tomorrow. Next trip, Fly Delta, the airline run by professionals. We take off to 90 cities every day. Delta is ready when you are. The Super Streamline Firebird, Pontiac's sweet sports car for those who take the excitement of driving seriously with Firebird style and prestige. Full foam bucket seats, radial tune suspension, Pontiac the Mark. Christine Jorgensen joins Chuck Ashman on the topic of a mixed view of sex tonight at 11 right after Metro News. Adoption, new choice for singles. Listen to the experience of single people, women and men, who adopt children and stay single on AdLib this Saturday at noon. Conflicts and problems beset a white family that moves into a small town dominated by Mexicans and Indians. Red Sky at Morning, starring Richard Thomas and Catherine Burns, Saturday at 5.